Um, I'm Ron Elisov. I'm the founder and managing partner of Northwind Group. We're a Manhattan-based real estate private equity firm that focuses mostly on the credit side. Uh, we have close to uh, $2 billion under management as of now. That number is fluctuated, uh, and I'll go over the presentation in a minute as we began investing. I, I formed the firm in 2008, and historically, we've bought distressed debt um, in the Southeast. Um, my background, real quick, um, I was born in Israel, but also raised in Boston as a kid, uh, served in the Navy. Uh, in various combat duties. Uh, last one was a commander of, of a battleship. Um, uh, and I got into real estate by accident uh, in 06. After the Navy service, I, I decided to work for a businessman that, that did a lot of real estate initially as his driver slash chauffeur. Became his right-hand guy. He taught me the business. Uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, he passed away very suddenly at, at an age pretty young. He's 55. And... Uh, some of his friends and clients uh, helped me out. I helped them out. One of them introduced me to his family office uh, back in Israel. It was the largest family office at the time in Israel. Uh, and I became their real estate guy and, and formed uh, my first fund in 08 under that family office umbrella. Uh, and that's when I formed Northwind Group. Uh, so the beginning was I was flying here to the U.S. looking for deals post-financial crisis. Uh, what made sense at the time was buying debt. Um, so we bought about 5 million square feet uh, through buying the notes, uh, mostly on grocery anchored shopping centers in the southeast, a lot of Publix anchored centers in, in Florida, Kroger's, AGB's. Um, met my partner today, is actually sitting here behind me, Pal Nicholson. He ran the direct investments for uh, the largest insurance company in Israel, the Phoenix Insurance Company. Uh, we did a deal together in 2012. We bought a, a 30, uh, sorry, 27 property portfolio in, in, in Texas, in Uni Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. And um, then we made our first evolution. The firm made three evolutions along the years. Um, so kind of we started on the distressed debt side in 08 to 2010, uh, then shifted to doing hardcore development deals, uh, mostly in New York City. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, between 2010 to 2017, we call it our equity years, where we've been on the equity side. Uh, we've done some smaller projects initially, and then some larger projects. Our, the largest building we've done in the city was a million square feet office building downtown. Uh, and uh, in 2017, for various reasons, equity stopped making sense for us. Uh, and we have basically shut down our equity positions. Uh, we sold almost everything. Uh, we went from, you can see it on the bottom graph, we went from almost 2 billion equity exposure uh, to virtually less than 400 million today. Uh, so we became net sellers in around 2017. Um, and, and our focus since has been exclusively on the debt side. Um, I think what we've done on the equity side which um, was highly complex transactions. For example, seven Hanover Square, which is on the top left kind of box. It's a million square feet office building downtown. It was a complete reimagining of a B class office building turning into an A class office building. Uh, we've done that deal together with the Garral family, which is a very large owner in the city. And, and the equity there was TPG, um, the private equity fund manager. Um, so that deal was completely reimagining the building. We bought it for 300 million. We put another 250 million in it, and we ended up selling it uh, for 850 uh, to a German bank, Commerce Bank. Um, it was the largest office sale in 2021, um, and that was really I, I focus on that deal because that was the last deal we bought in the city. So we signed the contract in 2017, uh, and we did the entire rehab value add, and then we sold it in 2021. And to me, that kind of signals the entire transition we went in the firm where we said equity is risky, equity is too complicated. In New York City especially, it seems that everybody, all the stacks are, are against you from the DOB to politicians to sometimes uh, tenants. Uh, and it just became highly highly complex environment. And, and the risk-adjusted return for us stop making sense on the equity side. 
And then as we started deploying debts, go back a bit kind of to the here. When we started deploying debt in 2017, the more we did it, the more it made sense. And that has always been kind of the theme in our company. We ask ourselves a very simple question that has a very complicated answer, but the question is, does it make sense? Does it make sense mostly on, on a risk-adjusted return? And for us in 2017, the answer became maybe, and then very sounding no in around 2018, so we completely stopped. Um, and our deployment on the debt side has been consistent to what we've kind of learned uh, in our history, which was focus on prime locations, uh, prime assets uh, with very good sponsor. Uh, today, we manage uh, one and a half billion across our real estate debt funds. Uh, so it grew from zero to one and a half in a little over three years. Our, our investors, about half our capital comes from pension funds, insurance companies, mostly foreign. Um, and then the other half is ultra high net worth and, and family offices from here in the US, from Europe, and, and, and Middle East, heavy focus on Israel, obviously, that's where I'm from originally. Um, and I think the most important thing to talk about here in our time constraint is what we're seeing in the market right now and, and kind of what our, our deal is. So we're heavily focused on New York City. Uh, we are very bullish on New York City long-term. And I should caveat that and say, we're bullish on New York City residential. Yeah, I would ask that. Yeah. <laughs> so we have currently zero exposure to office on our debt side, zero exposure to hospitality, zero exposure to other asset classes. So we're 100% resi. And in resi, we do primarily two things. We, we do um, condo inventory loans. It's a niche uh, lending product that we've became one of the most active lenders in the city. Uh, and we do various types of acquisition loans, bridge loans, predominantly on multifamily value add transactions and a little bit uh, kind of pre-dev acquisition loans or, or land loans. Uh, our fund mandate, unlike many funds, is very, very narrow. So our fund mandate in the LPA says at least 70% in New York City, at least 80% in first position senior secured loans under 65% LTV. We actually took that number down and we're now at 52% LTV. Wow. Uh, primarily focused on residential and very limited use of leverage, which is probably the most important thing you should look at or consider when you're examining debt funds. Uh, there is a very wide range of ability to lever debt positions from repo lines to warehouse lines to A notes to no note financing. We're not going to dive into that because we're, we're limited on time, but but we have we don't use repo lines. We view them as very dangerous because of external mechanisms that can trigger a call or a margin call on a repo line. And we've seen debt funds that collapsed or ran into serious issues because of that. Uh, we don't utilize a warehouse line. We the only leverage we utilize is direct single loan A notes, uh, and our leverage right now is twenty percent, uh, which is I think in a minute which is, I think, probably a third versus our competitive uh, set. Yeah. I sort of think you have 15 more minutes. You've got the full slot. Of that. OK, great. Okay. Oh, we got a lot to cover. Yep. That's good. Thank you, Marty. Um, you know, high level, I want to show this is, this, this is the current loan portfolio in our latest fund. Uh, our latest fund is going to hold a final close in October. Um, so all of these assets are New York City. Uh, and most of them are, are Manhattan. I'll, I'll go from kind of chronological order. Uh, we, we launched this fund in April, 2022. Uh, and you can see we took kind of a pause between June and November from, for very obvious reasons in deployment. The world was changing very rapidly. Interest rates started spiking. And, and when interest rates go up so rapidly, the first thing that imp gets impacted is valuations. And, and we're very focused on our underlying assets, valuations and LTV. So we kind of paused our, our, our originations until we felt we have a better understanding of where the world is heading. Uh, the first loan we originated was on as a prime location, 54 and 5th, it's a corner building. Um, it was a, a project that started pre-COVID with a different lender, got stalled during COVID, construction delays, um, 
And then we replaced the original lender. We wrote $162 million first mortgage loan. This project is, is fully residential. Uh, it's branded by the Mandarin Oriental. It's, it's the brand new Mandarin Oriental residences in New York City. Um, it's not a really typical project for us because we usually shy away from ultra luxury projects. We, we try to focus on what we call middle market condos. For us, middle market is, is units that are selling at an average sale price of a million and a half dollars. In New York City, that is probably the deepest market, widest market, where we have the most, the, the largest pool of buyers. So this project is very, very different. The, the average sale price here is, is, is almost $6,000 a foot. But our basis is less than a third of that. So our LTV here is about 35%. Um, the equity in this deal, 90% of the equity is the largest pension funds and insurance company from Germany, BVK, basically the Bavarian insurance company and, and pension fund manager. Um, so a very good sponsor or equity. Uh, they have about $200 million of equity in the deal. We wrote a $162 million loan. And when we gave that loan, they already had about $80 million of units under contract. Um, I should pause and say why we like condo inventory loans. I kind of mentioned it a bit. The reason we like condo inventory loans, the first one is um, that your takeout is not dependent on a single source. So when you give a typical bridge loan, your takeout is either a sale of the entire asset or a refi uh, by a different lender, a bank or uh, agency lender. Uh, your takeout in a condo inventory loan is the retail buyers that end up buying the individual units. So it's a wide pool, a diversified pool of, of takeouts. It's not a single source. The second thing we really like about condo inventory loans is the fact that the loan, the loan in its nature deleverages over the lifetime. Even if it sells in a very slow pace, and right now it sells at a very low pace because of interest rates in the general environment, every unit that gets sold, we get as a lender 100% of the net proceeds. And because we are, let's say, at 50% at LTV on average, and we get roughly 93% of the sales proceeds, our LTV starts going down over the lifetime of the loan, uh, which makes the second year, the risk adjusted return of the second year much more attractive because you're getting the same rate, or actually in the last year, we, we got more rate, higher interest rates on a lower LTV. That's kind of counterintuitive, but that's a, a very good place to be. Uh, and the third reason we like on the inventory loans, especially in New York City, because the banks can't do them. I mean, they can in theory, but regulation forces them to underwrite it as a rental and, and compute the value as a rental and based on that, provide the, the proceed level. So they can't reach the proceed level the sponsors need them to. So when you have banks out of the picture, even before the recent banking crisis, um, then it allows you to get more spread. So it's historically been in New York City, a debt fund, a private lender business, and it's historically been a higher spread business than, than conventional lending, typically three to 4% higher than a typical bank loan. So we found it interesting and we actually found it to be less risky than what people think. Um, the first question I usually get asked is, aren't you afraid of condo market and condo sales? Um, and honestly, the answer is no, but it's, it's a long answer and I'll try to, to quantify it. The main reason is, we are very focused on, on data. And when you look on the supply side in New York City right now, it's very limited. Basically, since COVID, in the last three and a half years almost, you haven't seen sizable new construction because of COVID, supply chain issues, then interest rates. Uh, and the city right now is at a, almost at an all-time low of supply level. So demand went down, definitely went down. But we're seeing the pricing remain the same uh, because of that supply limitation. Uh, and when we look, yes, Mark. Uh, I just want to, uh, can you talk about the trend of, of new inventory that might be coming on board and all this conversation about converting office? Because I think a lot of this office is not convertible. Is it? Well, you, you kind of answered the, the second, the half part of it. So it's very easy to say, let's convert. It's very complicated to do. Very few buildings actually fit. When I say few, we've analyzed, and we think there's about six to eight million square feet of buildings that can get converted and should get converted and probably will get converted in the next three years. Now, even if they all start today to convert, they'll deliver three years from now at best because it's a complicated long tail. So for our investment cycle, our, our, our typical investment period is three years. 
So, so when we look at the supply side in the next three years, it's still going to be start limited. And even if the city is going to start giving land for free to developers, which is not happening, and even if they re reinstate 421A, which was a tax abatement program, which they're not, but even if they do all of that, it takes time to deliver units. So when we look at the next three years, the supply side looks very healthy. It's very limited. It means pricing is probably going to stay the same or probably going to go up. By the way, it's true for multifamily rentals as well. Um, and that's why we focus on residential in New York City. Limited supply, demand is pretty deep and stable uh, uh, and, and, and consistent kind of performance for us. A new development you're saying is pretty level. It's, it's not like something that's not phenomenal. There's only 3,500 units being planned or built or permitted right now in the city. And the city has started growing again. Everybody spoke about that the city is declining in, in, in population, it was true. For 2020, 2021, the city declined in about 40,000 people. Now the city is growing 100,000 people. So it's growing 100,000 people. You're building only 3,500 units. The math is very simple for supply demand. Now, there could be macro events that we don't control, you know, mutiny in Russia that almost happened and, and other stuff that could impact global demand. And this, the city is driven by global demand, not just local demand, uh, especially on the high end side of, of residential. So. The demand side can fluctuate and it's very, it's much tougher to predict demand. Uh, but the supply side is actually very easy in a city like this. We have all the data, you see the permits, you see what's coming into the pipeline. And we really like the supply side right now. So that was deal number one. I'm, I'm not gonna dive into all the deals, but you can see that 175 West 95th Street, the Nova on Long Island City, these are all condo inventory loans. I should probably focus on 125 Greenwich. It's the largest loan we've done, uh, $313 million uh, first mortgage on a 292 stalled project in financial district. Uh, Fortress Investment Group, institutional sponsor, they manage about 45 billion. They actually bought the debt during COVID, ended up getting the keys, and we gave them the first mortgage loan. Uh, we're at 970 a foot uh, exposure. This building should sell at around 2000 a foot, so we're under 50% LTV. Uh, and this is the only loan we actually leveraged. We sold an A note. And that's why it's generating 23%. So our fund kind of, this is kind of the calling card for our current fund. Uh, we're 87% deployed, but the fund is still in active capital raise mode. So we, we, we deployed pretty fast within a year. We're at 52% LTV and we're generating right now 16.6 .6 gross IRR, uh, where most of it is coming from our interest and in spread, where it's so far plus eight right now on average. So it's a very high spread because of the reasons I mentioned. Uh, all the fee income goes into the fund and, and the delta between the fees and the spread and the interest is really the, the leverage that we have, that 20%. So we think that generating 16.6 .6 at 52% LTV on residential only in New York City with only 20% leverage, this is the best risk adjusted return I've seen since I've started the firm. Uh, and we think this vintage for private real estate credit is probably going to be the best vintage uh, because, and this is the last point I'll mention. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left, Morty. Is um, yeah, about five ten minutes. Yeah. What's your typical net return to investors? Yeah, depending. On, so we have we have an institutional class, and we have you know smaller investors. So so it's between range between call it four and a half percent to to two and a half. That it could be a wide spread. If somebody writes a hundred million dollar check, he obviously pays less fees. And pays, you know, doesn't pay catch up on the promote. So our 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 smallest investor, uh, by the way, our minimum ticket size is for for private investor is half a million. Um, so generates about twelve percent net. Um, and uh, we see this. We think this will will be pretty consistent uh, throughout throughout our performance right now. I would say our only our main risk right now is that. We don't create a hugely diversified portfolio. So we, we kind of employ a, a qualitative approach versus a quantity approach. So we will not have 200 positions in our fund. We're probably going to have 25 individual loans. So it's not widely diversified across positions, but we, we look at every loan from day one as if we own it. And not that we plan on owning it. We never own a single asset uh, that we lent on. We actually never foreclose on an asset and we, we have zero losses uh, in, in our 
Honestly, since, since I launched the firm in 2008, we have zero losses. Our worst deal did 6% IR. Uh, and uh, we've never taken back ease. Uh, but we employ a, a very onerous approach, meaning we underwrite it with our structural engineers. And most lenders I know don't employ a structural engineer when they do the diligence. We use our architects, we, we use our quote consultants. Basically the entire team that works for us when we own building, we employ on the debt side when we underwrite and when we do the diligence. Um, and we are not only hands-on in our due diligence, we're hands-on on management. So we are, if there is construction going on, and we're not a construction lender, but if, if there's kind of completion work being done, we're on the site every week with the, with the general contractor. We don't want to get secondhand information from the developers. It's not that we don't trust them. We just want to be very active in it. So we sit in the GC meetings with the construction team. We hear it and we know live if something doesn't go as planned. And in New York City, and when construction happens, it never goes as planned. It always takes longer. It always costs more. So, so. Um, you mentioned uh, institutionally the fortress. Are you, is that something that's done in sort of a, uh, in a bake off of financing or in getting this from a relationship of uh, more, more proprietary looks or smaller group proposals? So, um, this is kind of our pipeline analysis, and, and, and I'll answer your question. Uh, so, we reviewed in the last, I think this is the last two years, we reviewed over a thousand potential loans. It's about $47, $47 billion. That's a crazy number, but it's really not our addressable market. I think our addressable market was about a quarter of that. That's the $14.5 billion of loans we actually sent a soft quote on. A soft quote is, you know, five bullet points. This is the proceed level, this is the interest rate we would consider giving you a loan. And then you can see we've issued term sheets at about four and a half billion dollars of, of loans. Term sheets actually executed after negotiation about half that, about two billion, and we closed about a 1.1 billion. Um, about half of that deal flow came from brokers. And honestly, in New York City, I'm surprised the numbers are not higher. Um, if I'm a developer and I'm an owner, I want to go to market. I want to go to the widest pool of possible of lenders and get the most competitive interest rate. Um, so about half comes from brokers, um, you know, JLL, Walker Dunlop, Cushman Wakefield, all the brand names, and sometimes, you know, a secondary firm that just has a very good deal because they have a relationship. Uh, and then the other half is relationships we've built with developers, owner operators, and with banks. We also get a pretty sizable reference from banks we do business with, um, loans in their portfolios, loans they're looking at, um, and it's been a healthy mix. Of, of incoming and what's happening now, and I was kind of speaking on it before, the, these sort of loans in our, these sort of loans right now, I mean, we have, we have the German pension funds, we have the second loan on 95th Street at Meadow Partners, which is a six and a half billion private equity firm. We have Fortress, we have Park V Financial, that's the Hudson. These are all institutional borrowers. A year ago, we wouldn't be able to do these loans. They would have been done by banks. What's happening now, and this is why I think right now it's it's kind of the golden age for private credit lenders, private real estate lenders, is the banks are completely on the sidelines. Aside from a few, aside from the very large ones, JP Morgan of the world, all the local regional lenders are basically stalled. Uh, they're not lending. Maybe they're giving a loan to a very unique relationship they have that probably holds a big amount of deposits in the bank. And the market we've been able to capture right now is bankable loans that should be done by banks at a bank rate, uh, but are not just not going to get there. So the last loan we've closed, the Hudson, is actually uh, our first A note. So we didn't take the whole mortgage risk. Uh, there is a different debt fund that, that underwrote the entire first mortgage, and we gave them, so it's a $207 million first mortgage. We gave them a $100 million A note. So we are senior in the stack to the first mortgage lender. And it, it was done at a pretty high spread. It's so for plus 725, so a very high spread. Um, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing double digit returns on, on kind of 52% LTV exposure. So Ray, we'll see you at dinner. I, this is a lot more questions for you. I can't answer them all, but uh, great job. This is actually, I actually had a question about what's, it, what's, it, what's the general sentiment of the political side, but we don't have time to answer that question because I can I gotta imagine that everything you're doing 
and the bank pullback is pretty negative politically for people who are in office who are saying, you know, we got to move forward and we can't because banks are giving loans. Who do we go to? Do so we go to Rand? I'll, I'll, I'll just say that investing in New York City, the biggest risk has become the political risk. And what will come out of Albany and what will come out of City Hall, I, I have to say most of that risk relates to rent stabilized units and how they control or decontrol them. And, and we, we're not in that business at all. That's one of the reasons we focus on for sale condos and free market apartment, but that is definitely the biggest risk. Right, so and I, my, my closing comment is that California has gone fully rent controlled, the whole state. And, and the event we did last week in San Francisco, they suggested that might happen in New York next. I think it, in New York, it's probably not a question of if, it's a question of when. And, and, and the, reason, the reason is, if you don't fix the supply side, and they're not, supply side is limited there's going to be continued pressure on rents rents are going to go up rents go up tenants you know corral and make noise rightly so by the way the big bag landlords are to blame and instead of fixing the supply side the the populist vote says you know fix the rent a, a regulatory issue becomes something else right and unfortunately i'll say one more last comment in new york city in every city the tenants make about 98 percent of the voters Landlords make about 2% of the voting power. So obviously there's a big, and I'm a bit cynical, but obviously there's a big, a big, a big preference towards being favorable with tenants. If you are a cynic, you belong in our group. So anyway, thanks so much. Great job.